I'm so happy today to have Cliff Barrickman here. Um, you run the North American Bigfoot Center, which I just visited recently, but thanks so much for coming today. Oh yeah, happy to do it. And I'm glad you came by the museum. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just I went there last weekend and I've been wanting to go for like over a year because I, I didn't even know it was there until a, cu a couple years ago. And I'm like, this is like 20 minutes from my house. Um, if you're anywhere in the Portland area, it's very close by. Um, and I just, I'm kind of like a Disneyland nerd and had this very experiential feeling. Like you guys put a lot of work into it. Um, and it just feels like an experience, which is amazing. Um, well, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we're kind of a local attraction in a lot of ways. And um, it, it, I wouldn't say we're Disney-esque in any sort of way. That's not really the flavor that we were going for. But I mean, I, it is an experiential thing. Um, I was an elementary school teacher for quite a long time. Was before, that right? Yeah, before I was on a television show. So um, Yeah, it's very educational. Yeah, yeah. I, I try to funnel my inner nerd into uh, the museum. Um, because, you know, the TV show is great, but it's, television is a shallow, superficial medium. And I always thought we could do better for the subject. Mm. So um, it, the museum's my opportunity to do a good job for the subject, you know, and try yeah. to attack various modalities. You know, there's things in there to smell. There are things in there to look at. There are things in there to listen to, you know, try to do my, my teacher gig where I'm, I'm looking at these different modalities and how people can interact with the subject. Yeah, it really is engaging. And that's kind of what I meant. It's like you can... It's very experiential, and, and but there's a lot of education as well. Um, and I do want to, before I'm ignoring you, <laughs> Ren's here because he, I had Ren on a long time ago, and he's had a Bigfoot sighting, and he's a big fan of Finding Bigfoot, which you were on as well. I didn't encounter. I, I wouldn't say sighting, but uh, well, it sounded an encounter. Like a, we'll call it an encounter. encounter. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we can, what, we can chat about it later. Yeah. Well, I, I'm just a fanboy, a squatcher, so I'm here to enjoy the ride. All right. I appreciate me you inviting me. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I want to back up a little bit and just tell me, like, what started, you said you were a teacher, but what started your kind of Bigfoot research journey? Well, I've always been kind of an eccentric individual. Mm -hmm. um, it, and when I was growing up as a little boy in the 1970s, I was subjected to, like, those great early schlockumentaries, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. In Search Of and Legend of Boggy Creek and that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. And to me at the time, Bigfoot was just another monster. I, and, like, I imagine most little boys and girls, I, I like monsters, right? Always have. Um, but when I was in college, you know, fast forward a few decades, when I was in college, I had a few hour break between classes and I would go to the college library and just kind of, uh, you know, pull books off the subject that I was interested in and mostly science. I'm kind of a science nerd. And I, I one day in the anthropology section, I ran across a, a couple books that were, um, anthologies, like compilations of scholarly articles written by anthropologists on Sasquatches. Um, most of them were cultural, cult, cult, culturally oriented, like cultural anthropologists looking at of uh, say um, native people's traditions and mm. um, stories and depictions of giant hairy bipeds. Um, but a couple of them um, were written by uh, physical anthropologists like uh, Dr. Grover Krantz, for example, or somebody like that, um, taking a good look at some of the footprint uh, evidence that was available at the time and noting how uh, the footprints look like they might be big humans. But when you really look at how, how the foot is put together, they're not at all human-like. Mm. And in fact, they're very, very different in significant ways and in maybe subtle ways, but significant ways. And those differences coincidentally happen to be exactly the necessary biomechanical redesign of the foot that would be necessary to carry mass of their size. Mm. And basically, the more, but more about the evidence that I read from qualified scholars, the more I became interested. It's like, oh my God, maybe there's something going on here. And yeah, Bigfoots are quirky and funny and weird and everything I love, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, I was interested, I didn't take it seriously, but I love the stories of crystal skulls and Atlantis yeah. and all that other nonsense, you know, but this might actually be real. And since I was already backpacking and camping and whatever, uh, I just kind of put it on the list and, um, and started going to areas where Sasquatches had been seen or encountered before. And that was back in 1994, I believe. So okay. this is our, my 30th year of wow. doing field research in this subject and and you, you know, kind of grew up in the Northwest? No, no. I grew up in Long Beach, California. Okay, okay. Southern California, pavement jungle, you know, mm -hmm. essentially, um, which was great. You know, I, I got a degree in music at the end of the day when I was done with college. You know, I'm not a scientist. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a nerd. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I got my degree in music, and then um, I ended up teaching elementary school, and then t television t knocked on my door, and I did that for uh, nine years, and now I run the museum. Did you teach down in California or, or had you moved up here by both, then? Both. I taught a little bit in California. I taught a little bit in the Bay Area. Um, and then I taught um, right. a couple years up here as well. Can I ask where in the Bay Area? 
yeah, yeah. So my first teaching job ever was in Pacifica, California, okay. um, which um, Cabrillo Elementary School. Nice. Yeah. I grew up in the East Bay. Oh, yeah. Beautiful area. Beautiful area. I couldn't afford it even then, though. I know, right? You know, late 90s, I couldn't afford it on a teacher's salary to stay there. Yeah, out of the question. Yeah. And what point, when you kind of, when all that stuff piqued your interest, had you seen the Patterson footage or at what point? Of course. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Because I'm I'm younger, so I don't know at what point like that. That was, what, 70s? 1967. 67, okay. Yeah, in October. And I'm guessing it kind of hit TV and all that, all, all the media and stuff and created waves. And yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Probably in the early seventies, I think it was, uh, I don't know when the first time it was on a documentary. Well, probably it was the one that Roger did with the BBC. I'm not quite sure. I'd mm-hmm. have to go back and check the date mm-hmm. on that one, but it was around 1970, give okay. or take it a little bit. Um, after they got the footage in 1967, it was late 1967. So in 1968, Roger took it on tour actually, oh, okay. and um, would go to places like, um, he played the, I think the Portland Coliseum, for example. Yeah. And he sold tickets to show it and do a talk there. That's and really cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause it, obviously this pre-internet and that's, you know, yeah, it's just physical media. That was the way people showed stuff. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. And that's mm-hmm. really cool. How does, sorry, we're just diving right in. Sorry, Andy, but it's okay. Um, how does like the, the inner circle of the Sasquatch research BFRO community view the Patterson Gimlin footage. Is that considered authentic footage of a, a generally, Sasquatch? generally, generally there, there is a, um, um, I, I certainly consider it real. Okay. I, I know Bob Gimlin personally. He's a, he's a friend. Mm-hmm. Um, Roger died in 1973, I think it was, of a cancer that he legitimately thought he could cure himself of if he had enough money. He, he was a very kind of wow. early pioneer of like eating right and all this other stuff because he knew the, he I think it was Hodgkin's disease, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and he knew that if he ate right and exercised, and he was always, he was a gymnast. He was, he was very, very active. He knew that if you, like the more physically healthy you are, the better chance you have of kicking these things. Mm-hmm. But he... Um, kind of threw all that money away that he made on the film trying to chase down another Bigfoot mm-hmm. instead of going out and faking another film mm-hmm. like we, we would probably do since he made a lot of money at the time. Yeah. Um, and he thought that money could cure his cancer, um, but it did not. He actually died of it later. And Bob Gimlin, who's still alive, he's in his mid-90s right now living out in Yakima, Washington. Still. I'm amazed he's alive, yeah. That's oh, yeah. Man. Well, he, he's a healthy guy. He's a cowboy for a living. <laughs> like when I first met him in 94, no, 2004, I think it was. Um, he, he had a broken rib from, because he was still breaking horses into wow, his 80s or something wow. like that. You know, Jeez. he's just that kind of lifestyle. But Bob eventually sold his rights to the film for, I believe, $1. Okay, um, because geez. he was so tired of being called a liar and it kind of ruined mm. his reputation. It caused him some um, marital turmoil. Um, he eventually wanted out of his life completely. Yeah. Um, and of course, when you dive into the film, there's so- all sorts of these anatomical subtleties um, that that, are, that kind of pop out. But there are there is a small percentage of the Bigfoot community that thinks it's hoax for whatever reason. Um, usually, some weird discrepancy that they find buried in the minutia somewhere, or something like that. And also, there's unfortunately, um, and I think this is beyond the Bigfoot community. This goes into most things in life, I think. But particularly when you're looking at weird things like, you know, not the Bigfoot's weird, it's a perfectly normal animal, but um, the subject's a little unusual. Um, a lot of times people, um, they recognize that the more skeptical you seem, the more credible you might be. Yeah. And therefore they like to cast doubt on everything, mm. you know? And I think that there's a lot of that in the Bigfoot community as well, mm-hmm. you know? And for viewers, I think we should say that the Patterson-Gimlin footage is probably the most famous. You've yeah. likely seen it. It's uh, Maybe the gold standard of... Supposedly female, right? Yeah, it has grass. Watch, it's like waltzing through a riverbed. It's footage taken on a horseback. So the original is extremely shaky, and they've corrected it since then. You can YouTube it. Actually, Roger was on foot at the time. He was thrown from his horse. The horse reared over backwards, and, and Bob got his horse under control, but Roger was thrown from his horse. Um, it actually fell back on its own stirrup, and the, the bent stirrup still exists nowadays. I'd love to get that for the museum. Wow. Um, and then Roger chased after the animal, which is he started. So he's he running. Put, he's running. Yeah, and actually the running at the time helped us determine the um, help. Dr. Grover Kranz did the work, helped determine the frame rate because depending on the mm-hmm. frame rate of the film, um, the arms act as pendulums, and pendulums go by a very predictable formula, um, and you can actually determine uh, the approximate frame rate of the um, of oh, the film by idea. using. Yeah, mm-hmm. we're both kind of film guys, so that is interesting. Yeah, um, I'm gonna. I have vi- like questions about video sightings in a little bit, but I want to back up a second and just say, like, what after that kind of interest you had, what started the museum, the interest to start the center? 
Um, well, the the TV show went off the air at mm -hmm. some point, um, and largely because streaming exists now, and it didn't right. exist when it started. Yeah. Um, from what I understand, I was told this, and um, I, I don't know if the statistics are correct or not, but um, they're, they're probably pretty close. From the beginning of the of the television show to the end, um, I think television, cable television in general, lost something like sixty percent of its viewership mm -hmm. to the streaming. And therefore, 60% of its revenue and all that it's other stuff. It's probably the last heyday of that, right? Yeah, kind of like in the 90s, um, there, there was a revolution in music with the downloadable music and MP3s mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff. And it really changed the music industry in general. And streaming is doing that and has done that to uh, cable television as well. So that's largely why we went off the air. The show is still popular. It's popular now. They, they literally ran a marathon this past week. Wow. You know, and they wouldn't be doing that if it wasn't popular. You I know? turned it on this morning. Oh, was it on this morning? Well, it was like I think it was like on Pluto TV or something. Okay. Someone had it live. Well, yeah, it's out there, and you can watch it on demand. Too. It's making people money somewhere. Not me, but it's making other people <laughs> well, money. Well, uh, let's let's get that fix. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's get those royalties to Glyph. Yeah. Well, um, if you're, I mean, I don't know if you can remember, but in the 1990s, you guys are probably much younger than I expect. But um, um, I'm an old man now, and that's just the way it goes. Nothing <laughs> against you guys. It's really a, a finger it's pointing. All good. I'm almost here. 40, so I'm getting. There, oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm um, in the 90s. There was a writer's strike. Um, and all the studios kind of looked around and saying, what were paralyzed because of a bunch of like writers, come on. Um, and that's, that was the birth of reality TV, essentially, mm -hmm. uh, if I, if I understand the history correctly, um, they're saying we don't need these writers and get earning, you know, royalties and getting, earning our money that we think should be ours, says the studio owners. Um, so they invented reality TV and, like, um, we'll just go out and film. Yeah. Just stuff. go out and film yeah. in America. We'll, we'll, we'll eat whatever you force feed them and, and think, think they like it. So, um, that's how reality TV happened. So non-union stuff and uh, reality TV. I don't get royalties or anything like that. I just mm -hmm. got paid for each episode that I did. And, uh, and, and there you go. Wow. So, okay. Um, well, I know it was, it was a hugely successful show, especially yeah. on animal planet. I think, um, I think it was a boon to animal planet at the time from what I can tell. So we did, yeah, we did very well. And, um, you know, it, it, it was, a, it was a good show at the end of the day. You yeah. Know, we did our very best to do the subject as, as well as we could. Yeah. So, that was actually got yeah, right into my next things. Like, how did that, what are the origins of the show? How did that get started? Um, well, uh, one of the owners of the production company, and there are two owners of the production company that did it. Um, uh, but one of the guys says, you know, you know what? He, he wanted to, he saw that there was an absence of Bigfoot stuff on TV, mm -hmm. but there's all these ghost shows. I was going to say, there's a ton of ghost shows. Yeah, right? tons, yeah. right? More than you need. Um, and then, uh, so he went to the studios. He went to, well, the, 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 the networks basically. And he's, I remember uh, he told me, his name's Brad. He told me that th his pitch at the time, and I thought this was f funny and clever. His pitch at the time was, um, this is right after Farrah Fawcett died, if, uh, uh, you know. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> he's, he went, you know what? I'm a kid of the 1970s. Um, and the three things I remember about the 1970s is Farrah Fawcett, Evil Knievel, and Bigfoot. <laughs> Two out of three of those are gone now. We need to do something about the last. That's and, you know, and I thought that was a cute pitch. And basically Discovery um, Channel or Discovery Network's bit and mm -hmm. Animal Planet is uh, a subsidiary of Discovery. And that they decided to take it onto there. And there you go. But how did they find where you guys were just doing research and they're like, hey, these are the best guys. Yeah, from what I understand, and I, I heard this from one of the network people. And again, I don't know if this is even true, but this is what one of the network people told me over dinner one time and when I had to go to the network is that they at first tried to get actors because, you oh. know, most of these shows are just actors. You know, yeah. they're not really interested in the subject from what I understand. And, you know, most of the reality TV show, no matter what subject it is. Kind they're of, actors at yeah. the end of the day, you know, and they just want to be on the TV and they'll, they'll pretend to be whoever they are. Right. Um, oh, I'm, I'm a ghost guy today. Okay. I'll pretend to be a ghost. Yeah. Guy, definitely you know? the ghost shows are. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I know some, I know some of the ghost people cause I do conferences okay. and stuff with them. And yeah. the ones I know are, are seem to be pretty legit. Okay. They care about the subject. They were doing it a lot longer than the TV show and all that sort of stuff, which I guess is one of the litmus tests. If you want to find out if your favorite reality TV person is really legitimate, look them up. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cause there's going to be a, a, you can look up, you know, Cliff Berrickman and find yeah. that I've been doing doing this, you know, since the nineties, yeah, you know, you can IMDB credits for other, B, well, not even B that, not even on TV, like the real legit people never get on TV. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you can, you can look at, at, at researchers backgrounds and have they published anything? How, are, can you mm -hmm. find evidence of them being a Bigfoot person before, you know, finding Bigfoot? Well, you can with Matt Bobo and I, and Renee's, you know, she's a biologist. She's not a Bigfoot person. Um, but yeah, like you said, especially if they're publishing stuff. Well, yeah, but like I had a blog basically, yeah. and I get back to your answer to your question. I guess I was 
I was out there in the Bigfoot community doing my thing. Actually, from 94 to about 2000 or 2001, I was doing it just all solo because um, despite all of my um, professional occupations, I'm an introvert. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, I'm a quiet, introverted homebody. So this that is would, a nightmare for you. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I'm a professional extrovert. Yeah. No, I'm and the I'm same good way. At my profession. I tell people that on the show, and they're like, "Well, how do you do the show?" And I'm like, well, "I don't know." Yeah, I'm a professional <laughs> extrovert, and I'm good at it. Yeah. You know, um, but uh, most of my big big footing was work was alone. You know, because that's my nature. Um, but in around 2000, 2001, I was invited to go bigfooting with someone I respected a lot. Um, and she had published before and she had, um, she was an archeologist. And so I went and I started meeting other people. And then I realized by networking, it kind of propelled me, um, mm-hmm. much quicker into the direction I wanted to go. So I started working with a lot of other people and whatnot. And, um, I eventually joined Matt's group, the BFRO, and I'm not part of any group now. I'm not a group kind oh, of okay, guy, okay. you know, uh, but Matt's a good friend of mine. I, I find that be- by being in a specific group, whether it's, you know, the BFRO or anything else, um, other people sometimes won't work with you because yeah. you're associated with them. And then Just people in the group, oh, you work with it. It's like, weird no, no. alliances and stuff. I, yeah, yeah, I don't care about politics, weird. man. That's not my gig. Like inner, inner, inner political nonsense in the, in the Bigfoot community. That's like, I don't know, that's like, let, let's get involved in drama backstage right. at the Muppet Show. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, like, you know? That's like the last place I'd expect some like turf wars. Oh, no, it's everywhere. Bigfoot. I think no matter what microcosm you're in, you know, whether, you know, I imagine the ghost nerds are having a, have a, have a terrible time with each yeah. other. Um, or the UFO nerds probably have a terrible time. The Bigfoot nerds certainly do. You yeah. know, a bunch of stubborn, pig-headed people that don't sometimes don't get along well. I feel like um, anything you're always going to have weird infighting. Oh, yeah. Once it gets to a certain size. I'm sure. Yeah, 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 I think so, too. Yeah. I mean, my wife's really interested in weather, tornadoes and stuff. And she says she, she sees – I mean, she's on the outside, but she sees some of that there. And mm. yeah, every little community – has totally. their thing, I yeah. imagine. You know, I imagine archaeologists are all bickering with each yeah, other. Yeah. Yeah, I know paleoanthropologists do, so wh- why wouldn't they? Right? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm just, I'm picking up on the fact you use the term Bigfoot and not Sasquatch. Is there either one? You don't care. No, I don't there's care. no reason. Okay, I'm just, I was just curious if I was picking up on something there or not. But no, no, you, that, you use both interchangeably. I do. Okay. I do. Yeah. Um. And and I I also just a, as a point here, I use um Bigfoots. Bigfoots. Even mm-hmm. though that is incorrect. I know as that it is you incorrect. Mean, you mean grammatically incorrect? Mm-hmm. Just yeah. because we're referencing a species? Yes. A... Yeah. See, the Bigfoot is actually the name of an individual Sasquatch mm-hmm. that whose footprints were found on a number of occasions in Northern California in 1958, mm-hmm. and up to about 1963 when he just kind of disappeared. I say he because it's very a very large footprint. We're assuming it's a male okay. because of the sexual dimorphism in primates. You know, males are bigger than females. But um, but because Bigfoot was the name of an individual and therefore is very often capitalized, I mean, even like Microsoft Word will force you to capitalize the word. Um, yeah. it, it's not. I, I, people ask all the time, like, have you seen him? Mm-hmm. And that sort of stuff. So one of the biggest misconceptions about Sasquatches is that there is an individual Bigfoot and he has been seen in, from British Columbia to California to wherever, to Kentucky, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's one of the biggest misconceptions about the subject. And of course, if that were real, one individual being seen for hundreds of years all over the continent, of course it would be nonsense. Mm-hmm. Therefore, I go out of my way and I, and you know, I, I cringe a little bit every time I do it. I say big foots it just make, to drive that to home. Yeah. Really, it should be, like we have three big foot in this particular area. That's probably what it should be. Okay. But I force myself to say big foots just to drive that home. And Sasquatches, well, that's easy to pluralize. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, I find that like growing up in California where people are less familiar with the idea <clears throat> that that was the most common sort of barrier I could break down and say, hey, this is actually like we think this is a group in a species of biped, not mm-hmm. a mythological boogeyman. Well, clearly they've been boogeyman. It's multiple a... Sasquatches have been seen at the same time. So yeah, clearly it's not an individual. And I think that's a that's like an easy way to reach people and like get past the this is, you know, flatter flatter theory or something and get, get, make it a little more accessible and mm-hmm. kind of break down some of the i don't know initial skepticism that people have and yeah and the, the resistance the public resistance to the subject you know um it's understandable because of the way the media treats it a lot of times you know 
Um, they th they they focus on the hoaxes, like that Colorado train hoax from earlier last I, year. I saw that, yeah. Year. Yeah, that was a clear hoax. It was a commercially available suit. It was an obvious okay. hoax, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, but that's what the media carries. And then people see it and hear it and they hear, oh, that's fake. Oh, it's just another fake thing. Or the another um, fan favorite of the media, unfortunately, is the paranormal thing with Bigfoots. Mm -hmm. um, there is no paranormal thing with Bigfoots. Um, Sasquatch is a very perfectly normal species of mammal. It's like they a don't, regular creature. Yeah, they, they don't shape shift. They don't turn invisible. Okay. They don't ride UFOs. They don't. They it was aren't. one of my questions question is because my sister who went with me to the center is a big interdimensional dimensional believer and i was just like i don't know what to tell her about that but <laughs> you know what you know dimensions exist in mathematics that's true it you is science I mean? yeah. yeah yeah but uh not but do, you th do bears slip in and out of dimensions right, right. probably not right um sasquatches there is no evidence whatsoever that sasquatches do that in fact when you look at a sasquatch Everything about them screams, I evolved here on this planet mm -hmm. in this dimension. You know, um, there is nothing about them that cannot be found in other species of apes and hominins or other animals that frankly do probably that thing better than yeah. Sasquatches do. You kind of tell yeah. it's part of our ecosystem. Yeah. 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 I mean, everything about them, so the, the, the size, that, that there, there are precedents of apes being that large. Um, the, 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 the way, the manner that which they walk their gait, um, we, we, we can, um, theorize that Australopithecines probably walk the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, the foot structure itself with the mid tarsal pressure, uh, uh mid, mid tarsal, uh, flexibility that is seen in all other ape species, um, and most human ancestors on top of it, there's nothing about them that um, is unusual in any way, except that no one has killed one and brought one in and described it in a, an academic journal yet. And therefore they're not recognized as a species. Yeah, I was thinking when you were talking a second ago, do you think, do you feel like Bigfoot gets unfairly lumped in with a lot of those other paranormal things? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it like, and it yeah. does real damage to the subject. Yeah. Yeah, it d does damage to the subject. It does damage to the re serious researchers and the academics who are brave enough to stick their neck out and study this. Because um, I think at the very least, even if you don't think Sasquatches are real animals, there is something here to pay attention to. Mm. This is a, a subject of valid inquiry. Um, whether you think it, it is an undiscovered species of primate, like I do, um, or if you just think it's a, some sort of social phenomenon, you know, some sociological thing, there is, this is a valid area of inquiry. And I invite all serious people to look at it with a serious mind, and you'll find um, I personally think that you will find that it is an undiscovered species of animal. Yeah. Uh, that's what, that's what I went down. I went down that rabbit hole and that's where I came out Yeah, and that's where all the evidence points. I'll just say, yeah, when you say it that way, it makes a lot. I, I always think of that example people point to, there's however many species under the water that we haven't found. So mm -hmm. it just makes sense that like in these huge forests, there'd be, yeah creatures and along the same lines, you know? Yeah. I, I think a lot of the reason that people, uh, well, it seems so surprising to people because number one, well, it's North America. We should know about it because we know everything here. It's like, right. well, come on, relax. That, that's a that's a level of hubris, isn't it? Yeah. Um, that that I think you're um, overestimating humans, just and also you're underestimating Sasquatches. Yeah. Well, I was thinking maybe it's just people just think, oh, Google Maps has everything mapped, therefore we know everything mm -hmm. about it. It just mm -hmm. seems kind of silly, but um, you say something. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a question on behalf of some park ranger friends I have in the Gifford Pinchot area. Mm -hmm. Um. And that is kind of this paradox of like, assuming that Bigfoots are real, uh, I think it's safe to assume that they have some degree of uh, like intent to stay away from humans. Um, As do black bears. Yes. Sure. Right. Like mm -hmm. any animal usually. But the more we study and the more we pursue evidence, um, hard or soft evidence of Bigfoot, uh, don't we increase the risk of actually kind of compromising their ability to exist and continue existing and be safe? Like were you, for example, to bring a body in, mm -hmm. would that not really shift how the government and America looks at the idea of Bigfoot and could that potentially endanger them further? Absolutely. Yeah. And well, first of all, I'll make it clear. I'm not trying to bring a body in. Um, I'm not a gun guy. And um, these things, um, I don't really advocate for killing one of these things, um, even though I know that that it, I'm a realist. That's what science needs. Okay, I'm not going to lie about that. I am a realist, but that's not me. Um, my job is to educate the public and learn as much as I can about them. I look at the um, the playing field we have now, and I, I see that all of the major atrocities that humans have um, inflicted on one another are all born of ignorance. 
Mm. And um, so my job is to educate the public that these are actually out there. They're perfectly normal animals. They're part of the natural ecosystem already. Their discovery really won't change very much, honestly, at the end of the day, because they're already real. Mm. That's the thing. They're already there. You know, it doesn't really matter if we know about them, except that if when we do recognize them as a species, they can gain some sort of federal level protection. Now, arguably, they don't need that protection. They're doing a really good job right now. It seems like they're doing fine. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. between the Sasquatches doing what they do naturally, staying out of our way, et cetera, and the media doing its nonsense thing about, you know, the tinfoil hat wearing paranormal stuff, no one takes it seriously anyway. Okay. But it turns out they're real. And so one day that, that dead one or whatever is going to come in, Mm -hmm. or this is also an interesting, um, thing that's happening right now. Sasquatches might, um, give humans an opportunity to actually prove a species without collecting a holotype, the dead one to prove it. Mm. You know, every species out there, except for humans and oddly enough, a type of, a type of a monkey, which is interesting, that was deemed too rare to kill one. It might upset the balance, um, have what's called a holotype or a type specimen or a voucher specimen okay. where they kill one and then they do a dissection of it and look at the anatomy and the physiology, blah, blah, all that sort of stuff. And they write a paper about it and publish it in like nature or something mm-hmm. or somewhere like that. Um, it's called a holotype. It's possible and this would be, an, it's going to be an interesting thing, I think, for us. It's going to actually, I wouldn't be surprised if we actually struggle a little bit as a species about this one, because they are so similar to us. Mm. Um, they're they're clearly probably the closest living relative of ours um, on the planet at the moment, you know, it, barring some other um, unknown hominoids in Asia and that sort of stuff. Um, so can we prove these things are real without killing one? I think that's a really interesting question. Mm. Can we, for once, compassionately prove a species is there and then do something about it for the benefit of them, you know? Mm. Now, of course, when when the species is proven to be real, and it's an eventuality in my mind, because again, they're real, they're actually there. Um, when it is proven to be real, the feds are going to step in and, and there, there's probably some resistance to that because they don't like spending money on things that are useful. You know, they'd rather buy big boats and guns and things like that, you know? Um, so, uh, um, they're going to have to shut off some parts of the forest and some forest use until an ecological study of the creatures can be done to see what they need and how we're affecting them. Mm. I argue that we're not affecting them very much at all. Short of paving wilderness yeah. areas and, and greenways and stuff, we're not really doing much. So I think the only place in America right now that we're actually affecting them in any sort of significant way would probably be Florida mm-hmm. because such uh, such high level of development in Florida. It's a lot of concrete. And yeah, stuff. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like the, the swamps and stuff are being filled in and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. But I would argue everywhere else, um, with very probably very few exceptions that, that I'm just not aware of, um, they just move. You know, like the forest fires that happened in 2020 here, they just moved where they were and they'll be back in a few years once the second growth comes in. Mm. Um, we're building roads. Okay, guess where I find most of my footprints? On roads. Really? You know, yeah. Um, clear cuts, well, that 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 may do something for in the short term, like certainly in, in British Columbia, it's done a lot of damage to the bear population. Um, uh, I was talking to a bear guide, a professional bear guide just a few months ago, and he said that um, maybe 50 years ago or however long, there were about approximately 200,000 black bear in British really? Columbia. Wow. A lot. That's a lot. Yeah. Um, but because of bad logging practices, um, they've dropped that number to about 100,000. So okay. they basically cut the bear population in half in British Columbia. And it's largely from clear cutting and just throwing slash piles everywhere and literally burying the bears alive in their dens wow. over wintertime. Wow. So unless something like that is happening with Sasquatches, and I don't think it is. It's kind of, yeah, at least in this country, I don't think it happens. No, I don't think, I don't think that's the case. I could be wrong and I'd be sad if I was. Um, But I know know at least Oregon has pretty stringent laws against that. Yeah. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, there's, there's smart ways to log. I'm I'm not against logging or any industry really, but there's intelligent ways to do it. We need wood, you know, look at the table. We need wood. Forest management and all that. Yeah, exactly. It's important. Handmade, Um, Nathan Nottingham, shout out. (laughs) (laughs) But, but clear cutting actually could help Sasquatches because two or three, four years after um, all the really uh, nu- nutrient rich plants would be a- coming up in those clear cuts mm-hmm. because finally the sunlight is hitting the forest floor and sunlight is needed for nutrient rich plants. Well, that would bring the ungulates in. That would bring the rabbits in. That would bring all those animals in that are prey species for Sasquatches. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's like a fresh kind of ground for it. Yeah. I think Sasquatches are adaptable and intelligent enough to change their modes of operation slightly um, to accommodate whatever environmental challenges they they, mm-hmm. they encounter, you know. I'm probably late to this, but yeah, I 
I didn't even know until the past few years that they were like in the South or like in different parts of the, I mean, there's all these videos and sightings and reports and stuff, but, but it seems like they're super adaptable. Just thinking mm -hmm. about that even. Yeah. Different of, climates across our country. Yeah. yeah. Finding Bigfoot, the television show was an educational thing for me more than anything else. My main interest is like, well, this will be fun and cool and everything. But at the same time, I wanted to see the different environments in which Sasquatches are reported to be seen um, and see what they had in common, you mm -hmm. know? And I thought that was a very interesting and very educational nine years of my life. Um, and there are some commonalities, but what really struck me is the variety of habitat in which they occupy. Um, everything from uh, the plains of South Dakota, you know, you wouldn't think like these flat rolling plains in South Dakota. Um, specifically, I was on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Well, they're seen there quite often. The local people see these things fairly often. Um, and, but the thing is, they're seen on the plains at night when they're traveling from one uh, steep, thickly wooded river valley at night over the, the dangerous flat terrain where there's no cover into the next valley, mm. you know? So they are still in the thick wooded valleys and they venture out of those at night for whatever needs they have. In this case, one of the witnesses, it was raiding their dumpster, you know, outside the outside their house. Mm. But um, yeah, and, and, and or the swamps of Florida or Georgia, yeah, they're down yeah. in there or the yeah. Pacific Northwest and everywhere here is good, good habitat, it's and hard. I was gonna shout, yeah, the center does a really good job of even around the world saying how there's, you know, it's just a cultural thing and the differences of how cultures perceive them and name them and stuff. It's just a, the center does a really yeah. good job of tying that together. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, see, back in the 1970s, when I was first dipping my toe in this weird pool, um, according to the anthropologist, Sasquatches did not exist because they could not exist. There was no place for them. Mm. Um, and, and that was based on this idea that isn't actually true, it turns out, that only one animal can occupy a niche at in any, any, any environment. Because if two animals were going after that same um, ecological niche, one would outcompete the other and drive it extinct, essentially. Um, so th there was not room for more than one um, biped, a okay. hum human-like biped. We're going to call, let's call let's say hominoid, human-like thing. Okay, that's what that means. Um, but that turns out that's not true. Uh, back in the day, they thought human evolution was a linear fashion. Mm -hmm. Like Homo heidelbergensis was here, Neanderthals showed up and were just better at everything than heidelbergensis was and drove them extinct. And Homo sapiens showed up and were better at everything than Neanderthals and drove them extinct. This just linear clear, progression, yeah. which was reinforced by that real famous, uh, what is it, March of Progress, I think it's called, that painting yeah. where it goes eight, right. bigger eight, blah, 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 human at the end, yeah. you know? Um, that was reinforced. That's not the way evolution works, okay? Evolution is not a linear progression. It is a very bushy sort of thing where all sorts of different branches come out and some of those branches persist for a long time. And these animals coexist with other animals. Compete of some resources. and Yeah, yeah. or they, they get their own micro niches basically in the environment, you know? It's just like chimpanzees and gorillas. I, th I think that they overlap a little bit of their habitat. Well, they, they, they have their micro niches, right? Um, uh, so these... These hominin species, hominin is a very special word. It means everything on the human family tree okay. since we last shared an ancestor with chimpanzees about 6 million years ago. So everything after that, Neanderthals are a hominin. Homo ergaster is a hominin. Australopithecines are hominins. We are hominins. It's, the very it's our family. human side. Of... It's the human side okay. of things, right? Yeah. A lot of these hominins existed at not only the same time, but also the same places as one another. So now, instead of this linear progression where Bigfoot can't be real because there's no place in the, in the linear progression for them, now there are places mm -hmm. for them to be, you know? And in fact, if human beings, Homo sapiens, are the only hominin left on the planet, this is the first time in over six million years that would be the case mm -hmm. where there's one hominin left. Every other time, there have always been more than one that species of hominin like, on the planet. It seems like pretty strong evidence, actually. Now that... <laughs> well, this idea of relict hominoids <laughs> yeah. is, a, is, is really what, what we're looking at now. Yeah. Relict hominoids. Um, relict is a biological term that means still existing in small numbers, you know, even though they're probably more widespread. Hominoid, I already said, human-like thing. Um, in fact, all the living apes nowadays, bonobos and chimpanzees and gorillas and orangutans, they are essentially relict hominoids mm -hmm. um, because... Their their distribution was was once much much wider than it is now. I think all of the living apes are um, endangered at this point. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, back in the, I think the, the 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 Miocene or the Pleistocene, there were hundreds 
hundreds and hundreds of species of apes, everything from the tropical apes, like the, we only have tropical apes mm -hmm. today, except for Sasquatches, all the way to temperate environments in which we live. There were apes everywhere, all throughout Asia and Europe, um, and a lot in Africa, of course, as well. So it seems very reasonable that a small number of other species may have persisted in far-flung corners of the world. Sasquatch is just being one of them. We have um, other um, ape species that aren't recognized, that are reported, that are clearly are not Sasquatches mm. from other parts of the world. Mm. There is a thing called the Alma or the Almasty in Eastern Europe. Um, Western Asia, um, they they may be a form of relic uh, Neanderthal or maybe Denisovan or something, or maybe some other species we haven't even discovered yet. Um, the Orang Pendek in Sumatra, they only grow three to five feet tall on average. Um, but what is of interest is you may have heard of Homo floresiensis, the hobbit species that mm. was discovered in Indonesia on the island of Flores. Um, that was discovered in, oh, I think they dug them up in 2004 and were described a few years later in nature. Um, a, a, a viable recognized species to this day that maxed out at about three or four feet tall mm -hmm. on the same island that they still, that to this day, they have reports of small hair covered human like things on the island by local people. Wow. Um, it is. Yeah. Just the way you're explaining, it makes a lot of sense that we, we would be the outlier if, mm -hmm. if there wasn't that coexistence of. Yeah, species. this time especially, it'd be yeah. very unusual. It, it, it would be the only time, like right, I said, right, in the right. six million years that this has happened. And I argue that it has that has not happened yet. There are still hominin species walking today. Um, in fact, it was a, oh shoot, there was a magazine. I wanted, it's not Scientific American, but it's like the English equivalent to it. Um, we'll they, figure it out and we'll post it. Yeah, yes, yeah, from 2000, March 2012, their, their, um, their magazine, they had the 10 most important questions in anthropology today. And one of them was, are there other hominins still on the planet? Mm. So what defines a hominin and that branch other than we're sourced from the same split in the branch? Are there it's basically the, the human, the human side of the family Biped, tree? Biped or is there uh, any other like yeah, commonality? Bi yeah, bipedal um, would be one of them. Um, and I, I guess that would probably be the main one because Australopithecines, they weren't using fire or anything sure. like that. To, defining what human is, is really difficult. You know, it used to be tool use, but wait, crows use tools and they're not humans, <laughs> right? You know, um, like sea otters use tools. They're not humans, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Used to be bipedalism, but again, crows are bipedal, you know? And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of mm -hmm. squishiness in what, in what we think, you know, as, as we move into a more scientific and less mythological sort of mind view of the world, um, the things that we used to think made us so special, it turns out are fairly common, <laughs> you know? But I was thinking, it, you know, even if you think it's like human intelligence, now there's AI and we're just kind of useless anyway. So but... something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, okay. Yeah. Do you want to go? No, go ahead. Um, I was just, yeah. So qu a couple questions on behalf of my uncle, who's a, a big squatcher. Um, smell. A lot of reportings of like strong smell when in close proximity to one. Do you believe that's a real characteristic of Sasquatches that they're giving off an odor of some type? Okay. Well, first of all, um, only about 10 to 15% of sightings have a smell component to them. Oh, wow. So it's not as common as people think. Okay. Um, the, 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 the name of skunk ape in Florida kind of gives rise to that mythology that makes it a little bit stronger than it actually is. Okay. Statistically, it's 10 to 15%, somewhere in there. Um, and I do think it's a real thing. I've smelled them a couple times myself. And uh, whether it's in Northern California or the Sierra Nevada mountains or Kentucky, I've smelled the same smell years apart in some cases. Um, and it, it's a, it, it's pretty, it, it was the exact same smell that I've never smelled anywhere else. It's very peculiar. Um, kind of, uh, I guess the best words you can wrap around it are like, a, a dog shit Parmesan. Mm. You okay, know? Wait. First off new line of candles that I believe you <laughs> yeah. sell at the museum, dog shit Parmesan. Well, I wanted to make a, um, um, you know, like the, the car fresheners or whatever. Uh, yeah, I wanted to make yeah. one that smelled like Parmesan for that reason. You know? I yeah. think I'm going to pitch you <laughs> on an exhibit. That he, recreates the smell. He might we already, have one. Yeah, he, I think we he already one. does. Yeah. Of the smell? Yes. Yeah. How did was, you go about creating the smell? Well, there's after. a guy named Dr. Greg Bambanek who lives out of Minnesota. He's a biologist, um, but his living, he made one of these, um, he, he made a company that makes fish lure scents. Oh, you know, okay. like, you know, Could shrimp smell. Fish, yeah. yeah, that sort of thing. Very common here in the Pacific Northwest, you know, because fish have amazing senses of smell, actually far better than dogs even. Yeah, salmon are the most powerful, I think, right? Right, well, I don't know, I don't know, but they're ex extraordinary nonetheless, right? Yeah. 
Um, but so he makes that kind of stuff. And he's also interested in the Sasquatch thing. Um, so he made a side company called Osmic Research. And I don't know how he got it. It's none of my business. It's kind of like, don't ask, don't tell. Um, he got the sex pheromones from um, humans and apes and somehow put them into this plastic chip. Some sort of vaginal secretion, from what I understand, wow. but I don't know the details. We gotta keep our eyes on this guy. Yeah, and, and um, we actually have a very, very. The chips are about that big, about about an inch, inch and a half in diameter. But I, I have a less than cubic centimeter of one of these things in a squeeze, you know, mustard jar sort of thing okay. that you can puff in your face. And I've had it the same one for almost five years now, and it's never needed to be replaced because it's, still, it's, still, wow, so, it's so still strong. Potent. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Ba good bang for your buck then. Something like that. Wow. Yeah. This is a good, good guy to talk to though because Ren has this, he wants to open a smell museum, hmm. but that might be the guy to get the smells from. Yeah. One of the back of my mind entrepreneurship ideas is the Sniffsonian. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Where we I, I would go there. I, I used to go to the botanical gardens in San Francisco um, in, in Golden Gate Park oh, yeah. to their smell garden. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then walk around I didn't even there. know that was a thing. So extrapolate mm -hmm. that out to history mm -hmm. where you can sniff Abe Lincoln's sweaty hat. Oh, that'd be awesome. You should totally do that. <laughs> there you go. Got one customer lined up. I know. There you go. You can pre-order tickets. Um, <laughs> no I, promise on the opening date. Unless you have to, I have a couple of rapid fire questions. Go for it. Um, well, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, let's ahead. address the smell thing though. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Okay. Now there, there's a couple of possible sources of the smell. Like maybe there's their generally unwashed animals, which is what they are, you know? Um, although a lot of them are noted to be kind of almost groomed in some ways. But well, that'd be Abe weird because most like mammals, they may smell wild, but they don't smell like bad. Like my dog no. doesn't smell bad, right? No, no, no. They don't smell bad necessarily. So um, it could just be like from their um, posture, like fecal material running down their legs, for example, or their habit of eating carrion, like, you know, dead animals and that sort of mm. thing. These are possibilities, but I think there may be something else going on. As it turns out, um, it, it, we, we should always look at the other ape species, which includes humans, to try to find um, satisfactory explanations for interesting questions in this field. Um, and if you look at gorillas, it turns out that they have a scent gland land in their armpit um, that makes their armpits smell really bad. Now, humans, we have bad smelly armpits because of bacteria growing on mm. sweat. And it's the bacterial waste that makes our armpits smell. Okay. But in gorillas, it's something else. They actually exude something from a gland in their armpit mm. when under high stress situations whether they're being aggressive with another of their species or trying to drive something, uh, another threat away, some territorial dispute when they're arguing or fighting or when they're afraid, they can exude this smell um, that is often described in similar terms as a Sasquatch smell. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, Diane Fossey said she would always know they're nearby because you could smell them before you could see them. One wow, of those wow. things. Um, and this, so Fossey, this is... It's not a sweat gland. It's a it's a it's scent some other gland. scent gland. Yeah, and and new research. And I say new. This is probably about eight or nine years ago now. A, a paper was published in in the literature that shows that um, subdominant males, when they're going through a silverback's territory, purposefully do not emit those smells. Oh, wow. So they they have some level of control over it. How much we don't know, but some to level of control. Avoid confrontation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They don't want to piss off the big one, right? Um, so now, when you look at Sasquatch reports. Um, and some of their other behaviors, it, it, I am hypothesizing that it is very stressful for a Sasquatch to be observed. Mm -hmm. Now, part of my reasoning of that is um, like there was a Sasquatch that was seen several times outside of this town in British Columbia. They labeled him Old Smiley okay. because, and I've, I've spoken to several witnesses myself that said that it smiled at me, you oh, know, creepy. but it turns out that an ape species smiling or showing your teeth is actually a stress a stress sign you know hmm. like like uh, they're stressed out they're going to show you their their fangs yeah kind of like dogs yeah. yeah exactly yeah so um it, that indicates that it's stressful surely some sasquatches be observed now um if you accidentally stumble upon a bigfoot surprise it or if it's stressed out what if it has the same um uh, uh reaction as a gorilla like mm -hmm. oh i'm stressed out and it exudes that smell for whatever reason out of a similar gland so we don't know if that's the case, but it is an interesting idea. I, just, I think it's worthy of a further inquiry. Yeah, that's all very interesting science. I didn't know most of that stuff. Um, I just had a couple of rapid fire, like, and maybe you don't know these, I don't know. But what's the average, do they have an average lifespan? Like, do we know any of that? We don't know, obviously, okay, but yeah. all ape species, including humans, um, live to about 40, 50 years in the wild. Okay. Before some sort of dental death very often takes Natural them. Natural cause or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A, big, a big apex predator. 
Yeah, a big apex predator like a Sasquatch where nothing kills it for food. Um, you would expect that an accident or some injury or some sort of dental situation would take it out. A uh, tooth abscess very often yeah. gets an infection and destroys, you know, the brain and kills it and that sort of stuff. Or it dies of starvation like elephants and that mm, sort of thing. Okay. I'd like so. to mention our friend uh, Cam Miranda who's going in for his 90th dental procedure. I'm oh, is that assuming, right? I'm <laughs> assuming this week. Uh, he was out of the office all the time when I managed him for dental work. So, Cam. Okay. Uh, Shout I out. actually didn't know that. Yeah. Keep smiling. Keep um, smiling, Cam. Uh, is there an estimate on total population? There's estimates, but we we really don't know. Yeah. The, the best, I'm guessing continent-wide, just in North America, which includes Canada, and people don't understand how big Canada is, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Probably five or 10,000, I think, okay. is a reasonable number. Okay. And it sounds like a lot, of course, but, but um, it turns out that would make it one of the most rare large animals in North America by far. Yeah. I was just based on land mass. It doesn't seem like that, but no, it seems like a reasonable number. It, it does. We, British Columbia alone right. is bigger than Oregon, Washington, and California combined. Right. And most of British Columbia is completely unoccupied. You know, and the interior. Unexplored. Yeah. Yeah. Follow-up question. I know that the Northwest is considered at least somewhat of a hotspot for activity. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, curveball. I don't know if you've considered this, researched it, heard anything. Do you think that the St. Helens eruption had any notable effect on the population of Bigfoots in the Northwest, um, particularly because like pop culture interest in it was happening kind of around the same time. Do you think it affected them or if they like moved away or were killed off? Do you I don't know. Okay. don't know. But first of all, in the entire Mount St. Helens area, there are probably less than 10 mm. of these things. So that wouldn't really have a big dent in their population no matter what. Um, we don't know how they divvy up the, their territories, um, the study, there are very few people studying this sort of thing. There's a lot of people who are self-proclaimed Bigfoot researchers and they mostly chase down sightings and talk to witnesses because we're kind of epigenetically programmed to like stories. That's yeah. why podcasts even exist, right? We like stories mm -hmm. of the 300 plus thousand years humans have been around 99.9% .9 of that time. Um, it was all about stories around the campfire. So we're kind of, we're, we're, we're made for that, right? Um, but there are very few people actually studying how Sasquatches divvy up territories and population densities and individuals and what they're doing. Uh, we're doing that at the NABC, at the, at the museum, mm. but very few p other people are doing that. So we don't have a lot of good information about um, uh, guesstimates on how many there might be mm. overall as a previous question or specifically in an area. Um, we're making a little headway, but I don't think I'm going to live long enough to, um, to, to really get a good answer on that one. But I'll have a good time trying Hopefully to find out. But um, see, the Mount St. Helens thing... Uh, most of the damage was on the, the what is it, the the northeast side, right? Down towards uh, Spirit Lake and everything. Mm -hmm. But everything was kind of devastated. Um, a lot of elk died, certainly. A lot of bear died. Probably a few Sasquatches as well. Um, but how much? We don't really know. But the thing is, Mount St. Helens has been closely associated with Sasquatches for a long, long time. And actually because of an event that happened 100 years ago this coming July, the Ape Canyon event. I think um, I saw that. With, that's in the center, right? Yeah, we're celebrating yeah. the Ape Canyon thing, as I'm assuming everybody I'm else is as well. I'm unfamiliar with what that is. Is this uh, the one of the guys shot? Yeah, okay. yeah. In 1924, a group of miners were working, um, doing working their gold mine on the northeast side of, uh, no, southeast side of Mount St. Helens, um, at a place that's now called Ape Canyon. Essentially, it wasn't then, but uh, when they were up there, they were there a few years in a row, you know, chipping away at this little mine there. But uh, enough gold was coming out of there at some point where they built a small cabin so they can keep their tools in there and sleep inside instead of outside and and not have to walk out this crazy canyon and go to their camp every night. Um, th that particular summer, well, before they had seen large footprints, they didn't know what to make of them. You know, it's like, what is this? I don't know. But that particular summer, they put their eyes on a couple of these things. Um, one time they shot at it and um, it hit a tree and the thing left the, the valley and they watched it go away. Um, the next time they actually shot it and it dropped into the canyon down below, which is a couple hundred foot drop and it's precipitous and horrible. And I didn't understand, well, why didn't they get the body? I didn't understand until I went there. Now that I've gone there, I said, oh, that's why they didn't get the body. There's no chance. Um, I saw some of that footage in the center because you're talking, it's so steep. That, it's insane. Yeah. It's extraordinarily dangerous. Yeah. Um, and basically the night after they killed one, that same night, they said, well, you got to get the hell out of here. This is insane. The mountain, they called them mountain devils. Like everybody up there knew about the mountain mm. devils at the time. Um, one of these like sort of legends and mythologies around around the, the mountain. 
Well, the, the Sasquatches uh, apparently retaliated that night. They came and, according to the miners, you know, attacked the cabin and threw rocks and all that sort of stuff and hit the side of the cabins and, you know, that sort of thing and scared the heck out of them. All the humans survived and they left the next day. And then they they, they told the story and that's why the, the place is called Ape Canyon. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's 100 years ago this year. So it's kind of an exciting year for it us, is, 100th yeah. anniversary. Um, so Sasquatches have always been associated with Mount St. Helens, mm -hmm. um, because mostly because of that story, but they were, they've always been there and they're there now actually as well. I'm assuming so. the ape caves are also named. Yes and no. The, the apes were, were a group of foresters back in the 1920s. Um, and I think Bill Welch, one of the rangers at the time was, was part of this crew. There are a bunch of foresters back at the time and they sponsored a Boy Scout troop. And so the Boy Scout troop, I believe is called the apes as well. The Boy Scout troop discovered the ape caves like yeah. in the forties or fifties, mm -hmm. if I remember right. And um, that's how they got their name, but it's actually not far from Ape Canyon. Um, but it's, so it's tangentially indirectly named for yeah. Sasquatches. Okay. But not, I kind of put yeah. all that together when I went to the center because I was like, oh, this is Ape Canyon. It's right next to Ape Caves. It's kind of the same area. So, But that makes more sense the way you explained it. My, <laughs> yeah. my good buddy Clayton's a ranger who's stationed around there. So I'm letting you down, Clayton. I'm sorry. I should have known that. He's anyway. supposed to come on the show. Eventually. He was supposed to. He would have um, been a good guest. Um, let me see here. I, I really I wanted to ask quickly. I feel like I have to ask about <laughs> going number two. Like what? I think you had some in the center about apes scat. I don't know what you call it. Or uh, uh, what, what specifically about taking? I'm a just dump. wondering, like how they do it. Like what? Say what <laughs> you want to say. I don't know. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, yeah. Like you're very like biologically researched. Yeah. So I, does I a know. Sasquatch shit in the woods? Is what you're asking? Yeah. How do they do All it? Right. Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah. Um, now I have very, very few sighting reports of them doing it. Two come to mind. Um, or even just finding it or anything. I don't no, know. Yeah. I've certainly seen some big turds in the woods, you know, like, like <laughs> okay. really big turds, like, like either the monster of all bear or, uh, or a Sasquatch. But honestly, I don't really look into that so there's much. There's just no and, way to. Well, there, there's a couple of reasons I don't look into that. Yeah. Um, number one is that even if you, it, and now mind you, if I saw a Sasquatch taking a dump and it was steaming fresh and I saw it come out of the asshole <laughs> of the Sasquatch. Yeah. I would collect it and do everything I could with okay. it. Okay. Make a candle. I would do, I would, I would do something with it. Right. Um, but, um, finding a big turn in the woods isn't enough. I need direct one-to-one -one correlation with Sasquatches. That's a good and, point, e yeah. and even then, what are you going to get out of it? And, unless it's steaming fresh and you slough off the outside layer of it, where, where it actually came in contact with the intestinal wall, you're going to get the DNA or whatever of the thing it ate. That's true. Not the yeah. thing itself. I'm I'm think I'm realizing this now after I ask you, but yeah, you can't really reverse engineer that much. Yeah, from I was, it, I'm right? sure that um, mm. uh, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Cropophiles, people who love turds, would would disagree with me. Is that what and they're called? Uh, yeah, cropophiles, <laughs> okay. right? But at the same time, um, if if I put it out there that I was interested in this avenue of study, can you imagine the mail I would get at the museum? Yeah, don't want that. Yeah. I just don't want that. So I, I don't bother with that at all. Okay. But now there are, I, I have two sighting reports of people claiming to have seen Sasquatches poop. Really? One of which was in a river. Okay. Okay. Uh, a guy okay. named Glenn Thomas, actually, who saw these things in the late sixties. He saw down in, off the, uh, the Calawash river, actually the Clackamas and Calawash rivers mm -hmm. in that area. Um, he's claimed to have seen one, um, poop in a river. Which I think is interesting because you know you hop in the shower, you could probably have to pee. Maybe not poop, but you probably have to pee. Right? Yeah, it's kind of a, a nature's bidet. Kind yeah, of, yeah. I remember I had an iguana as a pet for a long time when I was much younger, and um, it, we had to make sure it took a dump once a week. We had, we'd put it in water for it to do it. Oh wow! It would stimulate that to to poop, right? Um, so that's number one. Is that okay? One report has them taking a dump in a river. The other one is a secondhand story. Dr. Jeff Meldrum told me this story. Um, and he was talking to, I think, a tribal cop on the Yakima Reservation in Washington. And um, he, this guy saw a Sasquatch and was following it at a distance. And he saw it poop. And he said that it covered it like a cat did. Ah, okay, okay. So uh, the only two reports of him taking dumps, so I'm, there's very little chance of... Uh, They're discreet poopers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So That's uh, interesting, but, though. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't know. They're also very, very rare animals. And poop doesn't last long in the woods. Yes. And, you know, bears have a habit of taking dumps in the middle of roads, so it's easy to find their stuff. Um, yeah, but again, I, it's, not, it's just not an area of interest yeah, yeah, for me. Yeah. And unless there was some sort of um, avenue for me to uh, positively identify it, I'd be interested to see what they're eating. But I suspect it'd be almost the same as a bear. Yeah, you know, they're the other big omnivores. Same so. prey and stuff. Yeah, so yeah. That, that's a that's a problem. For no, me. that's like how do I how do I discern Bigfoot shit from bear shit? Yeah, you know. No, that's great. I just wanted to ask that. Um, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about videos. Um, I was just curious. Your most convincing 
video you've seen or even maybe taken for me and maybe i'm in the minority on this but i i always watch the more recent mississippi skunk ape video i don't know if you've seen that one i have yeah that one just scares me for some reason, but I, I like that one for a long time but it turns out that um there's reason to doubt that one okay okay and, and it's because the name of the person who uploaded it is the same name as a fictional character um that a television show was supposedly filmed about in that particular area um who was i think so it's kind of a in the clue subject. to it was yeah. almost certainly a television hoax. Okay. Almost certainly at yeah. this point. I forget the name. It's like High Cliff or something like that. It's like something High Cliff or, or, or something like that. I don't remember what it is. But um, but that was the name of one of the characters in a TV program that they were mm. shooting in that area at that time about that subject. It is kind of weird. Yeah. To... Yeah. That's too much. Yeah. I, I've uh, at this point, even though it looks great, um, I just don't think it's Yeah. I think that's that. for me as a video person, like just fidelity wise, like you said, it looks convincing yeah. but um but yeah is there one that is it is it the patterson or is there one patterson Gim patterson gimlin films the best okay by far um it has the most detail it's the closest it is the clearest people say it's blurry but it is not actually um being film nerds you guys know that uh, I, um what infinite focus is mm -hmm. that's what that what yeah, camera was set on i believe it was 16 millimeter or it was 16 yeah. millimeter yeah so what you're seeing there is not blur you're actually seeing the limit of the granules yeah. on the film itself yeah. Um, film you can get quite a bit of resolution from 16 a lot, millimeter. Yeah. A lot. And then, of course, Dr. Isaac Tian, good friend of the museum and ours, is uh, he he did he used AI to not clean up because AI is a touchy thing. AI introduces new things into uh, pieces of footage and right. stuff right. to make it look, fill in the gaps where there is none. He did something else. He didn't introduce information into the film. See, the original film, the original one that Roger actually shot on is missing. We don't know where that is. Mm -hmm. It wasn't returned after a, um, the BBC used it for their documentary and blah, blah, blah. Long story. Um, which gives fodder to the people who don't think it's real. Yeah, it's also, I was just thinking, it's also like like NASA did that with like the, and, and that gives fodder to the Na NASA yeah, disbelievers. But like right. it happened back in the day with physical media a lot. Of right. Well, luckily there um, there were four, are four known first generation copies of the footage. Okay. Okay. So what um, Isaac did, uh, Dr. T and what he did is that he took all four of the, um, the, 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 the films scan frame by frame, scan by scan. And he programmed a script that if I understand this right, would look for, um, um, individual inconsistencies and then would remove that out of the, the film. So if it was in two or three of the pieces of footage, well, then you're reasonably sure it's out. It was actually something right. that was filmed that day. Right. But if it's not in all of them or enough of them, then uh, the, the AI would remove it. So what you have left is by far the clearest um, version of the footage ever seen outside of the original itself. And is that available somewhere? Where is um, it was on, uh, yeah, there's a television show that I work on. I do like a day gig okay. sometimes, you know, like I'm not a host of the show, but you know, those, those television shows where they show like a clip of something and have some nerd talk about it. Hey. You know, I'm one of those nerds on one of these shows. Oh, and yeah, it's, yeah. it's a show called um, The Proof is Out There. Okay. I think it's on History Channel. And a lot of the stuff is nonsense. And I tell the producers straight out, I, this is nonsense. They're, no, that's not this. And, and, luck, and they, they, they let me say whatever I want, and that's why I work with them. They never ask me to bend the truth or lie or do anything like that. Um, I don't know how they edit it. I don't watch anything I'm on, you know, because I don't want to be upset about what happens. But um, but, but it's on there. It's yeah. on there, yeah. I think season two, episode 13 or something okay. like that, if okay. I remember right. Um, they take a good, deep look at the PG film. Um, and I actually, I was out in the field with Dr. Tian. Um, we did some work for an upcoming documentary okay. um, called Sasquatch, Legend Meets Science 2, the second one. We we were out at the um, Paul Freeman film site. Uh, Paul Freeman's another film, uh, you know, the guy who filmed the Sasquatch back in the Blue Mountains outside of Walla Walla, Washington. He and I were out in the film, or we did some stuff at the film site with Dr. Meldrum. And then Dr. Uh, Tian and I spent a few extra days in the woods just, you know, doing Bigfoot stuff. And um, when I was out there, he uh, we were talking about it. He goes, Isaac, man, that that stuff you did on Proof is Out There was fantastic, man. I'm so stoked. He goes, oh, I was really disappointed, actually. I go, what? It was the best thing that's ever been made on the PG film. How, and he says, yeah, but I, I did so much more work and so much better stuff that they never showed. Mm. Well, and there you go. TV is a shallow, right. superficial medium, right? right? So that's why the museum exists to make an answer to that. Mm. But uh, the, so the best thing that I've ever seen on TV about the PG film was disappointing to the guy that's who the guy. did it. Um, <laughs> that says something about the level and quality of work that this gentleman does. Yeah. Because yeah. it was fantastic. It was ridiculously fantastic. On that note. Follow-up question, and I say this as a fan of the Finding Bigfoot show, but do you sometimes look back and feel like it? it's on Animal Planet, Discovery, it's television, it's dramatic, you have goofy cliffhangers. Do you feel like oftentimes, 
or maybe sometimes the characterization of like a Bigfoot searcher did more harm than good in the broader perception of this world. That was a great concern of mine when I was on the show. Mm. Um, because the, the, like they're real animals. We need to do them no harm, essentially. It's like, what is it, the Hippocratic Oath that mm -hmm. doctors take or whatever? Do no harm is number one. That was our greatest concern, at least my greatest concern. Um, and I took the job very, very seriously in that sort of way. Now, um, we have no control over the editing room. You know, and I was very sometimes disappointed about what they came out and sometimes like, oh, that actually made that look really good. And when, when I thought it was garbage in real life, you know, so it, it kind of went both ways, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Um, and they they edited and sculpted us into the characters that they wanted us to be, mm -hmm. essentially, you know, like any show would do, like any show yeah, would yeah. do. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And and so that was a little challenging at some times to us. But at the end of the day, I think they did a pretty good job. I mean, Bobo is a really funny guy. He's just naturally um, a character. He's a natural character for sure. And, and But, you know, Bobo's uh, not always happy with the way he's depicted um, because he's actually a lot smarter than they, they, than they let mm -hmm. him be. Mm -hmm. You know, he's one of the best read individuals that I know, but you wouldn't know that by watching Finding Bigfoot. One of my favorite things is he went on Conan. Uh-huh. And I think he took Conan by surprise because I think Conan was ready to be like have this super goofy, uneducated guy on, and mm -hmm. Bobo like just was so like level headed and prepared and like naturally funny. Yeah, that yeah. watching that segment is really fun because Conan's know. like I think Conan's just like kind of thrown back by how prepared yeah. Bobo was mm -hmm. and just naturally fun. Well, yeah. Well, again, if you take the subject seriously and you do your homework, I mean, it, they're they're real animals. All the good questions have good answers. Yeah. yeah, I feel like, yeah, and you're bringing a lot of those great answers today. Um, um, I did want to ask quickly about, um, I've been to the Bigfoot Trap when I was a kid in Southern Oregon. Oh, yeah, you know Gate, talking uh -huh. about? Oh, yeah. I was just kidding. I'm sure you've... Been... I've never been, still. Oh, I'd, still, been? Okay. I'd still love to go, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you think about, do you think that's an effective, like, th tool? To no, do? of okay. course not. <laughs> okay. No, it was a tourist I tool. think they end up no. catching other animals. Yeah, they got a bear one time, yeah. yeah. But Ron Olson, um, an early investigator and a filmmaker, actually, he he got it. He, he made that, and okay. I think it was part of a promotion to that a film. There was a film he made in the early 70s or mid-70s, um, Sasquatch... I forget. We have a poster of it at, at the store, actually. Okay. Um, it was but, part of that. Yeah, it, it was associated with that. He did other real Bigfoot stuff. He interviewed witnesses and probably took a few casts, but I don't know about that. Okay. Um, but, but a guy named Ron Olson. I heard he's still alive. I'm trying to track him down. Um, I heard he lived in lives in Eugene. I thought he was dead, but I just recently, like literally this month, heard that he is still living down in Eugene. Oh, wow. So I got to track this guy down. Um, I tracked down his brother. Mm -hmm. um, I, I So I know his brother's still alive. I'd like to speak to him. But... Um, yeah, because part of the NABC, the North American Bigfoot Center, the museum thing, we have three goals. We have three stated objectives. Uh, educate the public about the animals, um, use incoming information to drive our own field research, and then finally um, locate, curate, and preserve historic collections before mm. they get thrown away. Mm. Because the early researchers are either dead or dying at this point. Um, and what happens to their collections? What happens to their 500 eyewitness reports that they right, followed right. up on or whatever? You know, Weird Uncle Joe died. What's going to happen to his stuff? Well, Weird Uncle Joe's daughter or son are going to throw it away because they, they don't think Bigfoot's real. Mm. Well, I know they're real. And eventually, um, after their discovery and recognition, all this pre-discovery history is going to be of great interest, not yeah. economically, but like historically. And I, we're doing our best to try to find these things and protect them and curate them and, and you know, yeah. preserve them. I think that's a good goal. Preservation of all that stuff is just yeah. so important for history. And, um, yeah. um, I did want to ask one more thing before we get into these goofy questions, unless you had some stuff you want to bring up. Um, um, I was going to bring up the whistle anecdote. Yeah. But I can do that at the end because I'm not even, I'm just curious. Oh, okay. Um, just on the note of preservation, I just want to circle back really quick and we don't want to take up too much of your time, but um, if you were to stumble upon like irrefutable evidence of some kind. A I dead know, one? I know that you're not trying to kill one, clearly. Yeah. But yeah, let's say you found a body or an equivalent sign of proof. Like, do you kind of have a contingency plan in your head of what you would do step by step at that point? Like, what would you do first? It depends what the situation is, but let's say I find roadkill mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and somebody smacks one with their semi and it wanders off and, you know, hides itself and I find a little bit of it or something like that. I would cut off the biggest piece I could carry, mm. you know. Um, like an arm or something. or Whatever I could yeah. carry. The head is probably the most useful, right, right. unfortunately. And then a hand and a, a foot and after that, everything's about equal. Um, uh, but the first thing I, I would, 
there's a couple of things I would do. Um, Dr. Grover Kranz addresses this in one of his books, Bigfoot Sasquatch Evidence. Um, and he says that you should cut off a finger and hide it and don't tell anybody where it is because that will prove that you were the one mm. that found the corpse mm. um, just in case there's any nefarious weirdness, which there might be. You never know. Mm. You know, or, or people are always paranoid about the government and stuff. Well, mm-hmm, they, they, mm-hmm. I think they have a little bit more faith in the government than I do. I think, you know, they can't even speak to each other civilly. Well, how can they get their act together to do this, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, I would cut off a finger and hide that and not tell anybody where it is beyond my wife or somebody like that. Um, but my first call would be Dr. Jeff Meldrum from Idaho State University. He's a friend of mine and, you know, we work on some projects together. And um, he's a professor of anatomy and physiology. Oh, and wow. he would yeah. know exactly what to do with that. So mm. I, I do have a good number. Again, I, I'm a nerd with a music degree. Yeah. You know, I can tell you. I can tell, yeah. G sharp <laughs> seven chords or whatever. Yeah. But um, but uh, I surround myself with people who are far smarter than I am, you know, and, and I, I like that. You know, it raises me up and then it keeps me in a learning environment. Sure. So I would call Dr. Jeff Meldrum and um and have a very serious conversation with him immediately, and very likely put whatever I can in the car without telling anybody but my wife and drive directly to his university, and deposit the corpse there. Hmm. Okay. He'd be a fascinating guy to talk to. Does he ever come to this area? Um, sometimes, and when he does, he we usually do live events with him at the oh, museum. Okay. okay. Yeah. For, I'll for our museum one of those. members. Yeah. yeah. yeah so. What instruments do you play, if any? I'm a guitarist. Nice. You know, I, I dabble on bass and drums and keyboards and stuff like that. Ren's I'm, a I'm, big music you know, nerd, too. Yeah, I'm mostly a guitarist. So. Okay, nice. Speaking of instruments, um, <laughs> did Bobo yeah. used to have some kind of, like, whistle or flute that he would take on the show or around Ooh. when squatching? Well, I mean, um, all of us would take various noisemakers, you know, various sorts. Um, like, uh, I, I, I literally right now have a uh, slide whistle in my kit. Oh, nice. You know, because they're they're being intelligent animals, like all primates are. Um, they have a level of curiosity, and I hope that I, I've actually had some success um, where uh, I make noises they've never heard before, and sometimes that is interesting enough to draw them in. Now that, that was the whole finding Bigfoot thing. You know, we always did the night investigation and the search technique, right? I mean, I got a lot of flack from hunters and stuff. I said, "No, you're doing it wrong. You need to descent, go sit in a tree for blah blah blah, however mm-hmm. many hours." And I go, "Yeah, it's true, but that's terrible TV." No one would ever watch that. Yeah. No one would ever, ever, ever watch yeah, that. Yeah. So you basically either have to go in all slinky and quiet, which I argue doesn't work really well because you can't out Bigfoot a Bigfoot. Mm. Or you can go in, you know, being loud and ridiculous and hopefully draw their attention and bring them in for a closer look. Um, so we had to do that because, first of all, it does make better TV. You know, Bobo throwing a rave in the woods of Idaho is far better TV than Cliff and Camo in a tree stand where you can't see him and he's silent. Yeah. And also you got to remember there's cameras there. Right, there's right. a sound guy there. That, yeah. And th- these cameras and sound people are changing out batteries and cards yeah. every 45 minutes to an hour. Yeah. There's a producer taking show notes so they can piece it together in the editing room what actually happened. Mm-hmm. And who th- there's four or five people out yeah. every single time. You can't be quiet yeah. when you're out there doing a TV show. TV and Bigfoot do not match well. Um, so... Therefore, we went in loud and obnoxiously. And dr- so the sound maker thing, that's what that's all about. You know, you could use a harmonica, you can use a slide whistle, you can use whatever. Um, you can use animal calls too. But if you're using like a wounded, you know, fawn, you're going to bring in mountain lions too. And you have to be ready for that. Well, the story I've been fed by my family is that you guys did an episode near Morton, Washington. And on the episode, someone had a whistle of some kind or a flute. Mm-hmm. And my uncle took us on a, a squatching expedition to the same area because we were curious a couple months later. And my dad went out to pee in the woods and looked down and saw the whistle we had seen on the show and, huh. and kept it. So just a fun anecdote. I don't know. I mean, You're not Bobo does up. lose a lot of stuff, he but might he's have also not a litterer. So I don't know. He might have lost it. Maybe. But we need to figure out, yeah, if it's, it's got, like the same. It's got some of my same. father's urine on it, so we won't return it. But So I hope your dad's not using it then. Probably <laughs> yeah. not. It just sits on the mantle. He still a, has it. Uh, oh, of, okay. My uncle has it. Okay, okay. Those water whistles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, the only thing I wanted to ask about before, I always end with just goofy food questions like about you. Uh-huh. Not about, but uh, I, did, I did want to shout out Willow Creek because I love that movie. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Bob's movie. Did you yeah, talk to him at all about oh, yeah. that? Because I saw I actually, the poster. In the... I was actually filming down. I was filming... Uh, the the very very first Sasquatch footprint cast was made by a guy named Jerry Crew in 1958. Well, the, the ones were made before that, but this is the the one that's still in existence that started okay. the whole American awareness of Sasquatches. Okay. Um, gave us the word Bigfoot. In fact, um, I was 
no one had ever been to the location, the exact location where Jerry got that cast. But it turns out that his, uh, um, I got in contact with his son because the cast was kind of lost, but the producers for Finding Bigfoot actually turned it up, which is interesting. And then I followed up on that afterwards um, because again, producers, oh, look at this thing. And then they drop it because TV is shallow and superficial. They don't need it anymore. They got the shots, they, they go on. Well, guess what? There's a treasure trove of information there. Jerry Crew's son, um, Jerry's dead. He's long dead. But Jerry Crew's son, John, lived in Milwaukee, Oregon. Well, yeah. So, um, and he actually saw that footprint in the ground before it was cast. The very artifact that gave us the word Bigfoot. Wow. That started the whole Bigfoot thing in America. Sasquatch in North America. Sasquatch was that word was born in the 1920s up in British Columbia. But the word Bigfoot is because of this Bigfoot cast. Mm -hmm. Turns out that cast was in Milwaukee, Oregon. I've been looking for it for years and no years and way. years, and it was right seven there. miles from my house. That's crazy. You know, ridiculous. Um, no, I forgot where I was going with that now, but- uh, uh, Well, I was just curious, yeah, because you eventually, you did you cross paths when he was filming Willow Creek up there? Is oh, Willow Creek, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, um, so, uh, uh, but I was going to the, I wanted to film at the, ex pretty much the exact location where that footprint cast was made. Um, I got the map from Jerry's son and the whole nine where I, and I went there and I was out there filming at Bluff Creek and I went to the ranger station in Orleans to get a film permit um, for doing so. Cause mm -hmm. I follow the rules best I can, you know? Um, and while I was in there, there was very clearly another film crew there. Just a bunch so, uh, of people. Yeah. It's like, you know, the, 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 the harnesses for the sound gear, like very clearly this is a film crew. So I went up to the person who seemed to be in charge. Her name was Amy. I go, hey, you guys filming something? It looks familiar in here. And I go, yeah, yeah, we're filming a thing with Bobcat Goldthwait. I went, no way. Really? I, I would, is he here? I'd love to meet him. Um, I'm a big fan or whatever. And he goes, yeah, that dude right there. He's just right there. Yeah, and I looked at this, and of course, I was looking for, you know, police academy. Like, yeah, his ah, old. But he's like, no, it's like, well, that. So I walk up to Bob and I go, Hey, Bob. Hey, my name is, he goes, I know who you are. <laughs> and I went, no, that must have been flattering. no way. So he knows you from the show. Yeah. He knows yeah. me from the show. Yeah. Right. And then, um, I go, no way. And so, you know, um, I gave him a footprint cast cause I always try to bring a couple with me, you know, and that sort of thing. And, and we talked for a while and he, we, we shared some stories and, and he was actually filming Willow Creek at the time. He invited me to go to a, uh, one of their shoots, um, that, that scene where they filmed in the bar. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. I was in the audience drinking beer that night. I was oh, like, man. I don't know. If, I don't think I ever got on camera because they tried to keep me off camera. They actually did a scene with me for the movie. Like an um, interview or something? Yeah, yeah. something like that. Um, but they didn't use it for the movie because Bob told me, I'm, I'm in the extra, I'm in the special features on the DVD. You can see me do okay, that. Okay. Um, but he, he said that it just seemed too weird that these people were looking for Bigfoot and they ran in a cliff from finding Bigfoot. Yeah. That didn't fit the story <laughs> well. Yeah, I guess so, that... so they pulled it out, you know? Yeah. Um, but Bob invited uh, my wife and I and, and and everybody to like the 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 screening down in Eureka and um, and the one over here at the Hollywood Theater, and, you know. Nice. Um, and when he's in, he came to the he's come to the museum before and and when he's in town, you know, like like uh, actually tomorrow I believe is his birthday, so oh, wow, I'll, yeah. I'll be I'll text with yeah we've kind of become like friends, yeah. not, not close friends, but when he's in town he'll let me know and and I'll. I'll Go to Helium and watch him do his stand up and yeah, stuff. Yeah, I think he is actually coming in a month or so. Too. Oh, is he? Yeah, is he? I'm going to a different show, but I think he is on that calendar. Uh, yeah, we kind of become friends now, which is kind of nice. That's awesome because he's, he's a really nice guy. He's obviously has a deep interest as well. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, and it's, and what's funny is that um, one of the actors on that guy named Bryce Johnson, he's the male lead. He's actually on that other show, Expedition Bigfoot. Oh, is he really? Where, where he's kind of, I mean, he's an actor. He was, yeah. you know, he's on, I think he got a spot on the Gilmore Girls and he was on the the, the reboot of Magna P.I. But he's on that show, Expedition Bigfoot, as a Bigfoot oh, investigator. Wow, wow. Which He has a podcast too, I think. Okay. Um, I, I forget what it's called. Um, it'll come to me in a minute. But yeah, he has a podcast he's been doing years. But he looks into paranormal stuff and stuff too, so I don't really yeah. know. I just wanted to shout out, I love that movie. I love found footage horror movies, and that's mm -hmm. one of the best, and it's Bigfoot. Oh, it's great. So, it's um, great, yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to ask before I get into the goofy question? I'll ask you these two because I don't think you've answered any of these. Go for it. And you can also answer these for Sasquatch or for Bigfoot if you On want. On behalf of. <laughs> but um, I just always ask these. So let's say you're parking somewhere, a normal parking spot. Do you pull in or do you do back in normally? I push in. Push in? Yeah. You like, push your vehicle in manually with your. If I can, yeah, sideways. No, but I mean, like, I just <laughs> no, I just head in. I okay, head okay, in. all right. Yeah. What about you? 
Um, I I just pull in right, straight. Right, okay. Unless I need to make a quick getaway or something, right. maybe I'll take the time. That's true too. Like in the woods, I always turn around so I'm facing out. That's probably so smart. Actually, you like quick. Action. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, 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 should I need to? Right. Yeah. If something goes sideways, I don't have to spend. Yeah. The, you know, yeah. I've been backing in more this year. Um, which piece of fruit do you think you could throw the farthest if you just chucked it on a football field? And this could um, also this would be a good one for Bigfoot too. Is it right? They throw rocks. Yeah. How ripe? I, I think it's a reasonable ripe? question here. It's up to you. I think, okay. You can pick the ripeness. I can unripe. The, the goal is just to get as far as you can. I'd probably go unripe peach. Yeah, I was thinking peach too for some reason. Yeah, unripe peach. Yeah, right. I think that's a really good one. I like it. We're really dialed in. <laughs> we're aligned on the unripe no, no, I, peach. Yeah. No, I, still, I, think, I think that answer makes the most sense is why we both said it. What's Physics the, wise. What's yeah. the yardage you think you could get out of probably it? Probably not as far as I'd like, you know, like, you know. In your prime. In my prime? Yeah, I was going to say, because I'm 53 <laughs> years old now. Oh, I don't know. I'm, I've never been I'm a sport kind of guy, you know. Me like, neither. like, hey, you gonna watch the big football game today? And I turn it on. There's no Bigfoots, and I turn it off. <laughs> like, so I'm not not really a sport kind of guy. But I don't know. Probably about 30, 40 yards or something. As okay. A, like a, a really good throw. I don't. I have. I don't have the answer. But I always tell people if you want to take a video of yourself doing it, send it to me, and I'll I'll put it on. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you have a favorite type of French fry? Regular cut, crinkle cut, curly fries, waffle, waffle. Yeah. Do you like that's a specific a, a one, like the answer. Chick Fil A or something? Or? No. Okay. No. Just waffles. No, I'm just kind of a fan of waffles. I do like the breaded kind, though. Okay. And uh, and if I can't get that, then the, the the shoestring ones. Ooh, nobody has ever brought up shoestring. That's a good one. Yeah. I'd go shoestring too. Okay. Yeah. And I'll say I don't like the double battered like beer fries that really? are like, more orange. Mm -hmm. Can't do it. I get sick instantly. I didn't even know they did that. And I I had a guest last week that told me they do like triple fried. French fries. And I'm just like, I didn't even know you could do Let's that. Let's take it easy, folks. How many times can you do Let's, it? Let's kick back and stop. Um, do you like crunchy or smooth peanut butter? Maybe you don't like peanut butter. Um, I like them both for different reasons. Okay. Yeah. Amba, yeah so I call it amba peanut trip bris. Yeah, that's what's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I'm um, peanut fluid. You and do you it? like yeah. stir, no stir? I kind of like no stir for the convenience. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. I go crunchy, no stir. What about you? Oh, boy. You call it, you call it what? Amba what? Amba peanut I don't know. I'm just making that up. <laughs> um, I'll go. I'll go. Uh, stir just because I don't like the palm oil in that there. That does not surprise me. Um, it, it is inconvenient though, but I like both too. Okay. Um, do you have a favorite fast food? You seem like a healthy, healthy. Uh... Um, favorite fast food. I, I like any burrito truck, but that's not. I don't know mm. if that's. I don't know if that's a I fast that food or not. Huh. Yeah, I've rarely met a burrito I don't like. In fact, okay. I think burritos are probably the pinnacle of all food wow. like it is evolution. Pretty condensed into one. Well, there's thing. no silverware. There's no plate you have yeah. to wash after you're done. Everything you need is right there, and like there's no sign of it afterwards. Yeah. You know? Like like I I really think burritos are the culmination of of thousands, if not millions, of years of culinary art. They're in, they're in the hominin branch of the, the yeah. food evolution tree. Yeah. It yeah. holds up. What about you, got a favorite? We're kindred spirits. Burrito. California burrito, to be specific. If you can get the carne asada with the French fries in it, I think that is um, top tier. Okay. Um, um, let's say you're getting ice cream. Do you go a cone, waffle cone, cup? Um, out of those three, I'd go waffle cone. Okay. Yeah. But nothing, a, nothing beats like a pint, you know? Just the pint. I've had people answer that too. Just like, I'll just take the whole thing home and- yeah, yeah. Um, do you have what flavor are you putting in there? Do you have a favorite ice cream? Um, I I tend to go like the the chocolate brownie sort of things. Mm, that sounds you know? good. Okay. Yeah. What about you, Ren? Um, yeah, I'll, I would do a waffle cone too, depending on if I have to like walk around with it or not. Because I'm, I'll probably go cup if I'm like on the move. But Oreos uh, or a cookies and cream is probably All my right. flavor. Um, you keep your butter out. You keep it in the fridge. This is probably. I my prefer dumbest. to keep it up. My wife keeps it in the fridge. Okay. Yeah. Ooh. That's a tough competition. Tough. Yeah. It hasn't brought us to ruin yet, so I think we're okay. Well, you're in. Uh, Kerry Gold in the fridge, although I think I should probably start leaving it out. For, you use a lot of bread and stuff and that kind of thing. I'm kind of lightening up on the gluten lately, so. Okay. I cook with it, though. Usually I'm just throwing it in the pan to cook. Um, This is kind of a newer, contentious one I've been... Oh. I would start with. Do you like string cheese? I do. Do you peel it or just eat it? Um, I peel it thickly. Thickly, okay, okay. Yeah, because uh, maybe it's a patience thing. Maybe I like I like um. That's a good compromise, though. Yeah, okay. yeah. The, I think it's a matter of efficiency. Because I'm yeah. I, my whole thing is, if I were president, I would have an age cut off where you cannot peel it after a certain age because I think that's for children. And mm -hmm. I just want to eat it fast. But I like your answer because mm -hmm. that's a compromise. What's yeah. the uh, What's the punishment for that federal? Law? Uh, I haven't thought that out that okay. far. <laughs> it's string cheese, not chunk cheese. I know you that's what it. everyone tells me. It's in the name. You gotta. So I'm guessing that's the team you're on. Yeah, team string. <laughs> okay. 
All right, that's my last one. I, I do always ask people, if you have a gigantic brand you were forced to run, is there one you would want to run? I mean, obviously you run brands kind yeah. of already, but. Yeah, I think the NABC, North American Bigfoot Center, is okay. the most important one in my life, you know? Yeah, it's the one I feel most strongly, most passionate about. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What about, do you have a, ran, a brand you'd want to run? Sorry, what's the question? Do you have a brand you'd run, run, want to run if you were forced to run a gigantic brand? Like just step into the CEO Yeah, position? it could be a peanut butter company or something. Or <laughs> That's tough. Uh, Jelly Belly? Oh, of course. I'm by, I, I don't know who they're owned by. What? I think they're independent. I don't know. I didn't even think about that. That would be your company for sure. I mean, I think they're already about as efficient and successful as a company can be. Yeah. Um, I'll run Jelly Belly. I think you'd be a good operator. Thank you. Do you like Jelly Bellies, by the way? He, yeah, they're right. He I'm loves them. Not, not a huge <laughs> fan of that, uh, of that that kind of candy in general. Yeah. Not a huge candy guy anyway, honestly. Yeah. You know. Me too. Fair. As I get older, I get less of it. But it's, it's the flavor variety that keeps me going. You can you can enjoy it over oh, the yeah. course of a trip and not get burned out. Yeah. On the bellies. Um. Well, yeah. Thanks so much. Is there anything else you wanted to say? I was just gonna say, like, where where can people go to like donate or become a member or any of that stuff? Oh, well, you know, uh, if you want to help out the museum, the best way to do it is becoming a member. Um, the North American Bigfoot Center. I mean, we're out in Boring, Oregon. We're on Highway 26, right at the Boring exit, at the 212 exit. Um, you can literally see us from the road. Um, although, if you type in the address, GPS will put you a few miles down the road. Oh, um, unfortunately, um, but at the same time, it kind of works in our favor because as a Bigfoot museum, we should be a little hard to find. I yeah. sense, you know, <laughs> like that. Yeah, um, but uh, if you, people want to support us, come and check out the exhibits, you know, and and, uh, and see what's going on there. I learn a little something about Bigfoot. If you want to be a member, that's even better. Um, I don't, you know, I, I'm I'm out, I'm out in the woods at least once a week doing my yeah. thing out out in the woods. I have not stopped. I'm a lifer. It's what I do. I view I, I view this as part of my job. One day a week, I set aside to go to the woods and look for evidence and do things out there. Um, and what I do is I film them. I, we make short documentaries out of them, just, you know, the home, home documentary sort of things. Um, and we put them out for our members. Our members get two of those every single month. Okay. We, we bust our asses to get them out. It's That's a lot like of work. That's a Patreon thing or something? That's a Patreon. Yeah. No, yeah, it's a Patreon thing, six okay. bucks a month. Nice. You also get we, um, updates on footprint finds and my research or things that I think are cool or my upcoming appearances and all that sort of stuff. Um, that's a great way to support the museum. It's just six bucks a month, which is a beer and a tip. And yeah, our buzz yeah. lasts all month, right? So it's better. I also have a podcast. Mm -hmm. Bobo and I from the television show, um, we do a podcast every single week. It's called Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We have a membership there as well. But, you know, that's free. Just come listen. Enjoy it. Enjoy. Hang out with the Cliff and the Bobes for a, an hour a week. You'll get something out of it. Absolutely, so. yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah, visit the center. It's amazing. Um I actually didn't even know you could do the permanent membership thing. I might do that. Um, I just got the single. I think it's worth it. Entry, but yeah. I, I try. I mean, I, I charge six because they nickel and dime me, and I try to get five. You know, it really helps the museum quite a bit. Um, it's a small thing to pay, in my opinion, uh, especially for what you get in return. I mean, I mean, I see what's out there on online and the websites and the Facebook and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I, I, I and I, I strongly believe that we are offering the highest level Bigfoot content available anywhere online. Yeah. Um, and mo and that's easy to say because most stuff is crap you know and ours isn't you know so right there we're already a few steps yeah, above, yeah, yeah, right yeah. Oh, but yeah. the, you know um if, if you're tired of arguing with people on facebook come on come on over to our community and check it out you know and see if you like it i always say you know join for a month you have yeah. 20 or 30 videos to watch each one's 10 to 20 minutes long um watch them all in a week if you think they suck quit yeah just Six bucks months, is, is yeah. a small price to pay. Yeah. But I also know that once you see what we're doing, you're not going to leave. Yeah. Yeah, you've definitely convinced me that you're, you know, actively doing it a lot and you do real research. And yeah. So where were you, one to ten on the belief scale before this conversation and now? Um, You know, I'd say before, I was probably a six and now I'm oh. more of like an eight. Oh, because I, I don't know. You just bring a lot of like biological research to it that I was, uh, yeah, it's a, a impressed with. is biology. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. What about you? Did you shift it all? <laughs> I was a nine and now I'm a full 10. Baby. Okay. <laughs> all right. There you go. Well, yeah, Cliff, thanks so much for coming today. This My was pleasure. an awesome conversation. Nice to meet My you. My pleasure.